Okay, everybody, I'm going to get started if we think everybody's back in the room. I think most people are. Um, my name is Katie Duffy, and I'm here to give a presentation about inpatient pharmacy information. Um, I'm going to go ahead and give y'all kind of the disclaimer. It's a lot of information, okay? I do talk really, really fast, and so I'll get through it as fast as I can. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to either stop me or ask me at the end. It's up to you. So to begin, a lot of the stuff on the first couple of slides, really basic information, but just to let you know who we are and where we are, okay? And please know that for the duration of this presentation, I'm talking strictly about inpatient pharmacy procedures. So if we're talking about outpatient prescriptions for your patients, that does not come through us at all, okay? It can be a little bit confusing because the outpatient retail pharmacy of Erlinger is also named Erlinger Pharmacy Inc., but we are not the same, okay? And um, one other quick housekeeping thing is the majority of the audience a nurse, right? Nothing else? Okay, good deal. And then how many people do we have in here that are in pediatrics, NICU areas? All right, so some of the stuff I'll talk about is a little bit different for y'all, so I just kind of like to know who I'm targeting. Um, another quick question, how many of you are in the surgery arena? Any papers? ER? Okay, pretty good number. And then what about on the outside campuses? So east, blood, so north, potentially. Okay, good deal. All right, so you'll see why I'm asking some of these things in a minute. But um, brief overview, main pharmacy for BH is on the sixth floor. If you ever need to get to us, recommend taking the F elevators because if you take the D elevators, which is what a lot of people want to do, you're kind of just in the hallway um, and there's not really anybody to talk to, okay? So you'll think you're lost. The numbers there, we are open 24-7, 365. Our pharmacy director is Alan Broom. My role is that I am a clinical pharmacy director, so I oversee all of the clinical services and the clinical pharmacist system-wide. So some of the clinical services that we provide include um, kinetics dosing, so this is for like vancomycin and amine glycosides. We have an anticoagulation service. Any patient on the adult side that's on a TPN, we have a pharmacist that's responsible for writing all the ingredients that are in those TPNs, so you'll see them at the charts. Um, we also have multiple clinical pharmacists that round with the physician teams. So these are the individuals that you will see out and about writing in your charts, changing doses of medications, etc. Okay? We also have satellite pharmacy. So we have a pharmacy that's in surgery. Um, it's located on the second floor of the main campus and they are open Monday through Friday from 6 a.m. to 3 p.m. Please note that any of these hours when they're open, it means that there is at minimum a pharmacist present and many of the hours there's also a technician present, okay? But any of the times that these locations are closed, it means that those orders, phone calls, everything gets funneled through the main pharmacy, all right? <laughs> so Children's Pharmacy is its own separate entity and they have a pharmacy director, her name is Amy Seibold, she's fabulous. Um, they are now open 24-7, 365 as well. And then Erlinger East, North and Bledsoe also have their own pharmacists, pharmacies present. So the only thing here that's different, Erlinger East is now open 24-7, 365 as well. All right, so there is somebody there all the time. Um, that pharmacist, though, after 11 p.m. is alone, and that individual processes all the orders from NICU babies all the way to a lady that just had a baby to somebody that came in through the ER, all right? So you can see it can get kind of hectic at times. Any questions about any of this? Okay. All right. So we're going to focus a lot of time today on ways that we can prevent delays because that's one of the major, um, I guess I'll put it, complaints that we have. And so a way to better understand one another and what the process actually looks like and how we can help each other, okay? Um, so we're going to start with that. This is going to seem very nitpicky, but it contributes to a massive amount of time spent trying to get drugs to patients, all right? So you will all be in the areas where you have scanners available because we are currently still a paper-driven order system, all right? So CPOE is available, but it is used by less than 2% of the providers that work here. So the majority of the orders are sent via scanner on paper, which contributes to delays in and of itself, right? So those scanners, though, the problem is, is a lot of times the pages stick together. There is no patient identifying sticker on the order that's sent to pharmacy, which makes it very difficult for me to process an order, right, if I don't even know who the patient is. Then when I call, the first question I'm going to get on the floor is, well, who's the patient? I don't know. So all the time is spent trying to track down who was this for, who sent it. You can imagine, all right? Oftentimes, there's already been a delay getting the order to the pharmacy in the first place. It may have been written four hours before it was even sent to us. 
So then if you have to do all this in the background, it's just going to further contribute to the issue. Does this make sense? Another thing I want to point out here, if you are holding a written order in your hand and you cannot read it, the likelihood that I'm going to be able to read it after it's scanned over the system, comes through the computer and is on a screen, not good, right? So if you're holding it and you can't tell what it says, get it clarified before you ever send it to the pharmacy. Okay, because I'm gonna have to call you anyway. All right, so in addition to what I just mentioned, all of these items can contribute to why we can't process medication orders. I'm gonna talk about a lot of them in detail, <coughs> but the one that I wanna point out here, cross out orders are not DC orders. What does this mean? So if you send me an order from a Topher Law 25 milligrams, P-O-D-I-D, and it gets to the pharmacy, and lo and behold, you realize that you wrote the order or the doctor wrote the order on the wrong patient. It happens, right? Maybe the doctor decides that he really didn't want 25 milligrams, he wanted 12 and a half milligrams. It is not appropriate and not joint commission approved to strike through that order with a line and send it back to the pharmacy. Reason being, this is viewed as an altered order. The more lines on a piece of paper, the more strike throughs you have, the harder it is to read it, and the more likely we are to make a mistake. All right, so the appropriate way to handle this would be discontinue low presser if it was on the wrong patient or change the total all dose to whatever the dose is that's wanted. Does this make sense for everybody? Um, the other thing I want to point out, a lot of the things, most of them that we're talking about right now, will go away when we go live with Epic in October of this year, but we have to get there. All right, so until then, we still have to follow a lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk about. So allergies. As a pharmacist, I cannot put the first order on a patient's profile if I have no allergies in the system. NICU babies, they don't have any allergies. That's easy, right? But for any other patient in the hospital, I have to have something. It may be that they came in and they were so obtunded they couldn't tell you anything and it's unable to obtain, but I have to have something or the system will not let me proceed. A really important note here, is anybody here in the outpatient physician practice setting Okay, good deal. With Epic though, we everything's coordinated, right? Everything kind of in, integrates. So what's entered in a physician's practice, if they're owned by Erlinger and they use Epic, comes across to the inpatient staff. And that's the reason I ask is because if allergies are entered at an outpatient clinic visit and they're not correct, then it's gonna affect their inpatient staff. So my point here is when you're assessing allergies, assess them completely ask what the reaction is. If the patient tells you that Benadryl makes them tired, that's good news. That's not an allergy, right? If they tell you that penicillin made their tummy hurt, also not an allergy. This is a huge issue when it comes to antibiotics because I'm sure y'all are all aware of the fact that we have growing resistance to organisms. And if we say that a patient's allergic to penicillin because it gave them diarrhea, we just eliminated all penicillin agents and all cephalosporin agents for a tummy ache. And so therefore we have eliminated about 25 medications that we could use to treat an infection in those patients, all right? We can take allergies off of a profile, but somebody has to write an order saying, remove penicillin allergy or remove amoxicillin allergy, all right? Does this make sense to everybody? And if you're ever not sure, make the doctor make the determination. Tell the physician, hey, this is what your patient says. They say that they're only allergic to coding if it's Tylenol number three, that they're good with it everywhere else. How do you want us to list it? Okay, because it really does make a difference. And on that note with pain meds, if you send me an order for Percocet and you're like, God, I sent this order to pharmacy 45 hours ago. Why haven't they put it on the profile? Maybe it's because it says that they're allergic to coding. Because if they are actually allergic to coding, not likely, they can't take Percocet, right? So if it's just that they don't like coding, we don't need to list it as an allergy. Make sense? Okay. <coughs> so weight verification. Another thing that makes pediatric patients really easy to know, right? Everything's weight-based, so that kind of takes away that question. But with adults, there are only certain things that are weight-based. My piece of advice for all of you would be that if you know you're sending me an order for a medication that requires a weight to be accurately dosed, send the weight on the front side. Just send it on the order. Like if you're sending me an order that says heparin drip, write the weight in the upper right-hand corner. There's a place for it and everything. Because in the ER, it's very similar to how allergies are a hard stop for pharmacy. Weight and height is a hard stop for the ER staff to place orders. In the middle of an emergency, nobody really cares about an accurate weight, right? It's a guesstimate. But a guesstimate could be 100 pounds off depending on the person doing the guesstimation. 
So as a pharmacist, if I'm looking in the system, it doesn't make any sense. Maybe somebody said the patient is three foot four and weighs 72 pounds, but they're 52 years old. Highly unlikely. I'm gonna have to call and ask for the information anyway. Rule of thumb is it's gonna be easier to just send the information so I don't bother you later on, right? And 50 pounds, 100 pounds, big difference when I'm trying to dose a heparin weight or a heparin dose, right, or a drug. Any questions about this? And try to refrain from saying, well, the patient says they weigh. Who in here tells the truth when somebody asks them to weigh? Right? Okay. Right, so MAC and order verification. Y'all have or haven't done anything with MAC yet? Anybody know what it is? <coughs> So MAC stands for Medication Administration Check, and this is going to be where your MAR is, so your source of truth, right? This is where you go to see what medications your patient is on, when they're due, what the dose is, all that kind of fun stuff. Anytime a pharmacist puts a new order on your patient's MAC, the nurse has to verify that what I put on the profile is actually right, okay? The issue here is that it's a computer, so you can click on the button and say you verified the dose. But that doesn't mean that you actually looked and took the time to verify it. I can't strongly encourage you enough to make sure that when you're putting your initials on something that you're saying it's correct, make sure you're checking to see that it's correct, okay? And the reason I say this is that the pharmacist is really there to kind of make sure that what the doctor's ordering is appropriate. The nursing staff is there to make sure that what the pharmacist put on the profile is appropriate. We're humans too and we make mistakes. And just to kind of give you an example, in the current system, if the doctor writes for hydroxyzine on a patient, in the pharmacy system, when I look up a drug, I can put in as many letters as I want to. But let's say I put in HYD. Hydroxyzine is not the first thing that comes up, right? Hydralazine would be. So if for some reason I get a phone call or I, something else comes up and I click, yeah, on hydralazine, and really the doctor wanted hydroxyzine, and the nurse doesn't take the time, to see if that's what the doctor ordered, and they validate that the hydralazine is appropriate and give it to the patient, we both made a mistake. It's not just my fault, right? So you share that responsibility with us. So please, please, please make sure that you're validating these things appropriately and going through all the steps. Does that make sense? Okay. So this kind of ties into errors. So we already talked about the verifying the new orders on the chart. Um, always, 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 when you have the ability to scan the patient and scan the med, do not bypass this process. It is not there to make your day harder. It's not there to add time to what transpires throughout the shift, all right? It's there to keep you from killing somebody, honestly, okay? So don't bypass the situation. When you're overriding a medication, you can still scan it. The problem is, is that an overridden medication doesn't show up the same on a patient's profile. The computer system doesn't recognize that the patient's supposed to be on that medication because in order to override it, you only overrode it because there was no order, right? It's an emergency. I need this right now. Somebody gives you a verbal. The verbal doesn't translate into the computer, right? So when you go to scan it, it's not going to tell you that you're in the wrong patient room. Don't override unless it's an emergency. Anytime an error is made, they should be entered into eSafe, which is located on the intranet for anybody, okay? This goes for all occurrences, even a near miss. The purpose of the system is not punitive. It is there to try to evaluate processes. What was broken this day at this time when this happened, and can we do something to make it better? Is it an error that's happening system-wide, and the only way we know about it is because everybody's putting it into eSafe? Make sense? The last thing here. You are going to find out very quickly, if you don't already know, if you didn't come from practicing elsewhere, there are always workarounds, okay? Sometimes maybe workarounds are okay. Sometimes workarounds increase the risk that you're putting your patient in, okay? So I'm going to give you an example. High-risk meds, I'm sure y'all are all aware of them, insulin, heparin, oncology medications, TPNs. At this facility, they require a dual nurse verification in order to administer those meds to your patients, all right? So you got to have a buddy. Can you work around the system? Yeah. Do you think it's smart to work around the system? Absolutely not under any circumstance, okay? So I'm gonna give you an example, Taylor, okay? Taylor and I have been friends for 10 years, right? We've been working together for five and I'm the best nurse he has ever met. And he trusts me implicitly, right? So I have a patient that needs insulin this morning and I need him to go with me to verify that the dose that I'm gonna administer is appropriate. But Taylor's really got to go to the bathroom. He's dying. 
and he trusts me. So it's easy enough. He goes in, he validates the dose without actually validating what I've pulled up in a syringe and goes on about his business. Well, Taylor and I have had time to talk about it this morning, but you know, I was up, true story, with my 20 month old last night because he didn't feel good. And I'm really, really tired this morning. And when I pulled that insulin dose, I swear it said 10 units and not one. And I give it to my patient. And they get a blood sugar of 20. Whose fault is that? Just mine? No. Taylor's too. All right? And this may work out okay for you nine times out of 10, but let's say that patient dies. Nobody, nobody wants that one out of 10, right? It's never worth it. And I cannot stress this enough. Again, don't put your initials beside something and don't validate something unless you're truly looking at what you're putting your initials beside. Does this make sense for everybody? Because I got news. That family, they couldn't care less if Taylor's never even seen the bathroom, right? All they care about is that their family member is now injured because of our short cut, all right? Okay, so this is going to be kind of an example of but anyway, <clears throat> what your mar looks like on your wow. And I'm going to go through what the colors mean and what the symbols mean because it kind of helps when it comes to verifying medications, all right? So anything that is white on your mar is an active medication on your patient's profile. Okay, you'll notice that it has a drug name and the dose. Anything that is yellow is a medication that has been discontinued off your patient's medication profile. The pencil or pen I call it that you see right here, that is a medication that's pending your verification that it's appropriate. Once you verify it, you can see where you can just go in and click it. Once you verify it, that pencil goes away. All right? The DR that's in this little box, that represents, I think of it as a doctor symbol. It means that the order was initiated through CPOE, computerized physician order entry. This is helpful because when you're going to verify that order, if it came from CPOE, you don't need to waste time in the chart, right? Because it's not going to be there. It's going to be in the computer. The one that's down at the bottom is kind of like a blue-green color and in italics. This is an order that was initiated through CPOE, but it has yet to be validated by pharmacy that it's appropriate. All right? So you know the doctor placed the order, but you also know that pharmacy hasn't looked at it yet. Once I look at it and validate it, it pops up to the white section. The DR symbol stays. And there's a pencil in front of it because you've got to validate or verify it. Okay? The one other thing that I want to point out here, there's going to be another column that I'm going to reference in a minute. It's called the additional SIG section. And that's for additional instructions or directions. And we use that to communicate quite a bit. So I just want to kind of give y'all a visual of where it would be. All right? Any questions about this before I move on? So home meds, this is just a slide to let everybody know that we do offer med reconciliation in the ER, but it's not 24-7-365. We don't have enough staff, unfortunately, but we do have a pharmacist and technicians down there. It's every day, it's just not all hours, okay? So if your patient bypasses the ER or comes during a time when the pharmacy staff isn't there, unfortunately, med rec still at this point falls to the nursing staff to take care of. Um, we would like to do it all the time. Home med verification. So we do not allow patients to take their home meds if it is something the hospital is able to provide. It's not just an Erlanger rule, it's a CMS rule as well. And so if a patient wants to take their home lisinopril, they're gonna need to take the lisinopril the hospital can provide. And I'm gonna explain why in a second. Now, if a patient is on the medication that we can't provide, maybe it's something that's not on formulary and we're not going to buy it because it costs $8,000 a pill, right? And we're never going to use it again. It is acceptable for the physician to write an order, the order's required, that says okay for patient to take home med and list what the home med is, all right? At that point, you're going to see why we don't allow this for lisinopril. At that point, that medication has to be brought to the pharmacy with a piece of paper from the intranet that has all the check boxes and the pieces that we have to fill out. And a pharmacist has to verify that what's in that bottle is what the label says and not extra Oxycontin, okay? At that point that we validate it, you get to take that medication back with you to the floor and keep it in your bedroom. Can't put it in the cabinet. We can't barcode it. It can't be loaded, right? You can see where I'm going with this. We're not gonna do it with any and everything because it's not easy to track. There will be something on your mind that says home med verified. 
So you can document that you administered it, but you can't scan it, right? There is no barcode. So you can see why this is not really ideal. Sometimes it has to happen, but we don't want to do it more than we have to. When we transition to EPIC or eChart, as our lingers calling it, this will get better and we will be able to barcode the medication. We will be able to load it into the system or into your pack. Okay? Any questions about this? <coughs> so pharmacy policies and protocols. So I've already mentioned that we have clinical pharmacists in a lot of different areas. The other thing I want to point out here is that there are a lot of things that we do on the front side. So for instance, any adult patient in this hospital that's on Banco, pharmacy manages the dosing. Okay, we order the levels, we change the doses, we order any labs that we need to make sure that we're dosing it appropriately, and we do not have to be consulted to do so. It is a process that's been approved through Medical Executive Committee, all right? Same thing goes for any medication requiring renal adjustment, all right? This should be done at order entry. How do you know that I didn't just mess up, all right, and put in the wrong thing? That additional six section should tell you that we've changed the dose per protocol, all right? Um, I think that's really about all here. But just a reminder that we will be doing this on quite a few items. So we do have standard order entry times. Again, this isn't just to be annoying. This is because you don't want to be giving meds all day throughout the day to your patients, right? Like one at 715, then at 720, then at any more so than you already have to. In addition to that, there are items like Coumadin that need to have set dosing times. Coumadin is given at 1800 in-house. It doesn't matter what time the patient took it at home. While they're here, it's 1800. Reason being, we want to make sure that if an INR has been drawn, the lab has time to run the information, get the lab result back not only to you, but to the pharmacy staff if we're the ones dosing it, or the physician, so that we know the lab result before your MAR is telling you that a dose is due, right? Because you don't want to give a dose at 7 a.m. of Humidin and then find out at 10 that the INR was 7. So the longer we wait, and that's why we thought it out this way. We can't also carry, as I mentioned, every single product out there, and it's not really necessary, okay? I mean, we've got a high-intensity statin, and then we also have Zocor. We don't need every proton pump inhibitor. So again, how do you know I didn't just make a mistake? This should be in the additional six section if I've changed something out because of our formulary restrictions. Okay, any questions? This also helps with shortages, right? There's one every 32 seconds. So if we weren't able to switch things out, this would be really difficult. All right, so this slide's a little bit difficult to understand if I don't give you examples. So in the MAC system, you have the ability to non-administer a medication. When should you do this and when should you not do this? And I'm going to give you two examples. The first is when you should not do this. You have a patient that's on Vanco Q12, 8 a.m., 8 p.m., all right? Your MAC is prompting you because it's 7.30, let's say, that you've got a dose of Vanco due at 8 a.m. Well, your patient's been in surgery since 6.30. You physically can't give the Vanco at 8 because they're not going to be back. <clears throat> However, your intention is to give the Vanco when they get back from surgery, right? If you non-administer that 8 a.m. dose of Vanco, gone. You will be prompted again by your MAC to give bank until 8 p.m. tonight. The likelihood that you'll remember when that patient gets back from surgery, not good with the 40 billion things that y'all are doing, right? So the recommendation here, let it hang out on the bar. I know that there's a lot of pressure that the medication is supposed to be given per hospital policy in that 30 minute window before or after the drugs do. There is always going to be a circumstance where that's not physically possible, right? When you chart that med and the patient gets back to the floor, you can chart that the reason it was late is because the patient wasn't on the floor. They were in surgery. You're not gonna get in trouble for that, okay? It's a way bigger deal if you never give the dose at all, right? When should you use this function? For whatever reason, you know, it's 1800 and nobody has been around to round on the patient that's on Coumadin, the INR7, you know you don't need to give that dose and you certainly don't want the shift coming on after you to give the dose. That would be an appropriate time to non-administer a dose so that it goes away and nobody's trying to decide should I or shouldn't I give this Coumadin, right? Does that make sense to everybody? Any questions? I will point out a lot of times the question that I get about um, dosing is, can you retime medication? So like if you give the Vanco late, what happens? With antibiotics and certain other products where it matters, the system automatically retimes it for you, okay? So if you administer Vanco at 9.30 instead of 8 a.m., it will automatically push back that second dose to be due at 9.30 tonight or 12 hours from that dose. Make sense? Yes, ma'am. If the patient refuses the medication? then you would not administer it. And you would document why. 
Okay, so with that, if you're not, if they say no, you just keep going, right? You don't like try to give it again. And try you to no, you would document that you didn't get it, and that the patient refused, and you would notify the physician okay. that the patient refused the dose. Any other questions? Okay. <laughs> so the Joint Commission has lots of things that they recommend for hospitals to put it kindly. Okay. So we're going to go through some of these. Again, a lot of this goes away with Epic because it's taken care of in the system. But the number one thing, and they were just here, we just had a visit, and we got in trouble multiple times for this one thing, okay? PRN orders. I know that Zofran is for nausea and vomiting, right? Every time I get it. But it has to be written every single time if it's written PRN. No exceptions. All right, so back to where we were talking about scanning and order to pharmacy. If there's no indication with the PRN med, please don't send it to me because I'm gonna have to call and ask you to fix it. The problem here is that oftentimes it's not nursing's fault that the, all the information's not there, but it does fall to nursing, unfortunately, to have to remedy it most of the time, right? So if you know that you're gonna have to get the information anyway, go ahead and do it before the order's sent. Um, there are also prohibited abbreviations. The reason for this, raise your hand if you think doctors have really pretty easy to read handwriting. Papers. So QD very oftentimes can look like QOD. Who thinks I can see this decimal point before a five on line paper? Right? So these are things that are likely to hurt somebody because it's hard to interpret. The nice thing about the abbreviations, they're all listed at the bottom of the order sheet. So there's no reason to forget them. They're right there. Okay? We're not supposed to process orders if there's not a PR indication or if there's an unapproved abbreviation. I'm not saying it never happens because things slide through the cracks or whatever, but we're not supposed to process the order. The Joint Commission can cite us, and they will, if they find a PMS, okay? So this is the bigger deal that really tied into the PRN orders. One of the other rules by the Joint Commission is that PRN orders can't have duplicates. What does that mean? It is very common practice for physicians to want to write pain meds as a range, not acceptable. They want to write Percocet 5, Percocet 10, Morphine 2, Morphine 4, all as needed for pain. Just arbitrary pain. Well, what you're going to give is going to be very different than what you're going to give, very different than what you're going to give when you got four different options with no parameters or guidance, right? It's nice that a lot of the doctors obviously, in good reason, trust the nurses to make the clinical decision. The problem is the Joint Commission says that's not acceptable, right? For the reason that I just explained. So, if I receive an order in the pharmacy with four different pain meds, PRN pain and no parameters, we're not going to process that. We actually have a policy in place and an order set in place that when that happens, we can implement it and it assigns a pain med for mild, moderate, and severe pain. That comes back to you. It is an order and it takes the place of whatever order the physician has written. It is always first step to get the order clarified, right? The doctor really needs to determine what they want their patient on. But when that's not possible, the order set makes it so that your patient isn't suffering just because we can't write orders correctly. Make sense to everybody? Same thing goes for medications for nausea and vomiting. <clears throat> it's okay to have Compazine, Phenadrin, and Zofran on your patient's profile, but there have to be parameters for when to use which one, right? So maybe Zofran's first line, and you're only supposed to use Phenagrin if there's no relief with Zofran. Make sense? And finally, only one route is currently processed on your patient's profile at a time. So if the doctor writes for Phenagrin to be given via every orifice your patient has, our pharmacists are instructed to evaluate the patient. Where are they? Do they have an NG tube? What makes the most sense for the patient right now? And we pick that. In that additional six section, we'll tell you and put it in there that all these other options are available. You just have to let us know that you want it, okay? You can send me a Mac message and say, hey, my patient passed a swallowing study. Can you switch it? Absolutely. We don't need a new order. Make sense? All right. Anybody in here familiar with an Omnicell med cabinet or a Pixis med cabinet or kind of know what I'm talking about? Okay, good deal. So we are an Omnicell med cabinet system. We have PIXIS supply stations, but all your drugs are going to be in the Omnicell cabinet. All right? It is our goal to have up to 90% of medications in those cabinets. If it's an area that closes, we may have more than that. But there are always going to be things that we can't stock in cabinets due to stability, due to price, 
there are all kinds of reasons that we don't put things in the cabinet that know that this is kind of the first place to look for a medication okay so missing doses where I want to start with this is to kind of explain to you what the process well I'll do that on the patient slide we'll start here so if you think that you're missing a dose again the first place you need to look is on the cabinet all right and another thing to keep in mind it's a computer right it's a big box it's a computer that has meds in it with drawers if I haven't processed the order i.e. I haven't put John Doe on Percocet yet the Omni computer doesn't recognize that John's supposed to be on Percocet so you know that it's in the cabinet but it's not showing up on John's med list because I haven't put it on John's med list make sense it's not that it's broken it's just not there yet you also have to verify it before the Omni machine recognizes that John's supposed to get that medication we get questions about this sometimes and um, the other places to look if it's not your cabinet if I'm sending a medication to you tube station med room and the med room refrigerator are appropriate places for medications to be inappropriate places for medications to be your wallet, your pocket for indeterminate amounts of time the nurse's station just laying out on the counter right these are considered unsecure areas anybody the patient environmental services anybody can walk by and take whatever they want if they're just laying out right you can't do that <clears throat> the other issue here is controlling cost benefits so there are certain items and we don't do this process on the pediatric side but there are certain items in the cabinet multi-use items inhalers insulin pens these can be put back in the cabinet under what's called a patient specific bin after you use it so you take it out on John Doe you go administer the inhalation and you're supposed to put it back in the cabinet not carry it around in your pocket or put it wherever to get lost reason being some inhalers are 250 dollars right so if you misplace one and have to take out another one we are currently charged on dispense so you alone in one shift just charge the patient 500 dollars for an inhaler that i cannot credit back to the patient because it's been used if the next nurse does the same thing and then the patient's discharged you're looking at a thousand bucks for inhalers that weren't even utilized right same goes for insulin pens quick question here who thinks you can use an insulin pen the same one on multiple patients correct never gross hep c okay um so anyway with missing doses there is a missing dose function in that so on a medication you've got a patient that has we'll use a levomir pen and it's on these are in your cabinet but it's on your screen you can pull it up on that patient and it allows you to send me a message to the pharmacy saying I don't have any of these I need one <clears throat> the problem is I cannot respond to you in time okay I have two ways of communicating with you currently the phone or I can type out a message and print it to the printers at your nurse's station where there are about 5,000 other pieces of paper all right so if it's something you need to talk to me about or warrants conversation don't use the MAC function for these things. Missing dose, sure. Emergencies, never. All right? And if you're going to have to talk to me anyway, you might as well talk to me when it's convenient for you than for it to be two hours later and I call and you're in a room and it's contact precautions, right? So do it when it works. So I already kind of talked about this, but from a communication standpoint, um, this is the, you know, send the MAC messages once and check your printer because we may reach out to you that way. This slide is about patients, and this is where I kind of wanted to talk about the pharmacy system. I would love to actually walk every new nurse orientee through the pharmacy so they can see what it looks like and that we're not up there playing Yahtzee, um, how many of us there are, what it looks like to process paper orders. The fact that we never have more than four pharmacists in the adult pharmacy processing orders at any given time, okay? So think about it. The entire Baroness campus, except for the pediatrics patients, and granted, I told y'all that we have people at East and we have people at North, but that we still have a lot of patients here, right? So it's not like there's 42 of us assigned to different areas, okay? We aren't decentralized yet, which is where we would like to be, but we're not there. So you can imagine that it can be really, really, really hard at times, just like it is for all of you. So I have two screens in the pharmacy. I have a screen that looks like the screen I showed you earlier that lists all the medications, all right? I have a secondary screen that is my screen where all those pieces of paper that are being scanned to me go into in the order in which they're scanned I don't know that this order from trauma 
is a double concentrated norepi drip, and the next order from trauma is a dolphalite suppository. Okay? The MAC messages, guess where they go? In the MAC queue with all those other pieces of paper. So if you notice that I haven't processed any of the medications on a five page order set, if you send me a MAC message, it's just going to go down in the queue below the five page order set. Don't send me the same five page order set five times. It is not uncommon for us to have up to 200 pieces of paper in that work key because of all these duplicates that I talk about. And because we have four different pharmacists, at different times of the day, we may all be covering the same areas because of lunch or whatnot. So I might get the five-page order set the first time, my partner may get it the next time, and then somebody else the next time. And so every single person has to spend an excessive amount of time trying to figure out why am I getting this again? What did we miss? I noticed this is on here, but did we miss something from it? If there's a 20, an um, order set with 20 meds on it, and I forgot one of them, circle it, asterisk it, send back the one page with that highlighted medication so I know what I need to do as opposed to spinning my wheels, okay? Because it really will ultimately, it's detrimental to the patient because it does delay the process. And again, try so hard not to send stuff over and over again. A lot of times it's innocent, it's because it's shift change, all right? but just something to keep in mind. If you're sending me an order for something that's emergent, call me, okay? Don't call me for Nolcolax. But if you are sending me that order for a double concentrated norepi drip, a friendly phone call and say, hey, Katie, this is Susie in trauma. This is what I'm sending you. Can you process it because I need it now? Absolutely, because then I can at least look at all the orders I have from trauma and find that one and process it, okay? Stat turnaround is 30 minutes. This may seem crazy, but think about it. If it's something that I have to compound in the pharmacy, first I have to get the order. Second, I have to make sure it's legit. I have to put it on the profile, a label has to print. In order to go into an IV room and be compliant to all the state and board guidelines we have, I have to scrub out like I'm going into surgery, okay? During the day, we keep people in the IV room. But if it's 10 o'clock at night, I don't have the same number of staff on hand, right? So if they have to dress out, that's not going to take 32 seconds. Then they have to make said product. Then a pharmacist has to verify that the product the technician made is appropriate because it's my license, right? Then we have to get the product to you. This isn't going to take five minutes. If it does, pet it, call it a unicorn, because it's probably not going to happen ever again, okay? <laughs> and you might not want it. Unless it's a pre-made product, it shouldn't take five minutes to get it to you. That's a big word. So, anyway, just be patient with us and call us if it's an emergency. All right, so I'm going to go into ADR and then go back to the burden. So, ADR reporting, this is just to show you any time you have to give Narcan to a patient, then a drill for a drug allergy, if you'll report it, we can look into it and see what happened, all right? If you're removing a medication on override, certain ones out of the cabinet, it will actually ask you, is this being utilized for an ADR? Again, adverse drug reaction. If you'll just say yes, it automatically prompts the pharmacy, okay? And so then that's all we need. Your job is done. But it's just important that we look into these because if we're consistently having patients over-sedated in the same area, this could be a problem. Is there something wrong with the lot of the lot of that's there? Or is it because of a specific person? What's going on? All right? Any questions about this? All right. So last topic, very, very important topic. Anybody know or want to tell the group what medication diversion is? Any takers? Okay, so medication diversion is taking a medication from your patient, usually for your own use. Who thinks I'm talking about a beta blocker? Okay, so usually, always, it's a controlled substance, okay? <clears throat> the thing that's important about this is that I'm sure you all are aware, opiate addiction is on the rise, right? Most Addicts don't start out like the individuals that you may pass on Rossville Boulevard, right, with a sign. <laughs> they start out like you were up. They don't look a certain way. So you can't say, well, they don't look like they use drugs, right? The unfortunate thing is they say that one in ten healthcare workers quarterly are on a prescription for an opiate all the, at one out of ten quarterly. So that estimates like to about 333 million people. The difference of it being a healthcare worker versus somebody on the street is what do you all have access to? Controlled substances, 
right? So when maybe a doctor decides that they don't want to write for that prescription anymore, but the individual needs it, right? There's access. And they're probably not going to be able to turn it down. Okay? So one of the things that the Joint Commission actually requires is that we have a process for investigating, reviewing, evaluating possible diversion in the healthcare system. Any organization that has access to controlled substances is supposed to be monitoring diversion. All right? So we use a system called Pandora, not the music app. All right? It's a system that coordinates with Omni cabinets. And it's pretty neat in the sense that it can actually look at every single area in the hospital, okay, at every single controlled substance in those areas. And it compares you peer to peer. It doesn't compare a CRNA to a NICU nurse because that's apples to oranges, right? That wouldn't even make sense. It compares nurses on 4,000 to nurses on 4,000 for dilated one milligram syringes specifically for a 30-day period, all right? When this report generates, it's an anomalous usage, high user report. Just because somebody shows up on a high user report doesn't mean they're diverting controlled substances. They could be taking care of that patient, I'm sure all of you are aware of, that needs lots of Dilaudid every 32 seconds or else they're gonna scream at you all day, right? And maybe you took care of that patient every single shift you work and you worked overtime. It happens. But if I find out Susie has only worked two shifts in the last 30 days and removed 72 one milligram allotted syringes compared to 12 of her counterpart, Susie's gonna have to go take a drug screen, right? So the big thing here is, again, accountability, guys. So we talked about putting our initials beside something. If every time Janie asks you to waste the allotted, she doesn't have anything to show you. She's conveniently already wasted it, and she has nothing for you to see, but she wants you to say that you watched her waste it. Bad idea. If that consistently happens with Janie, I would be telling me, your nurse manager, whoever, but somebody needs to know, all right? If every time you have the opportunity to go to the bathroom, John gives all of her patients Percocets, you didn't ask him to, and he's never helpful with blood pressure meds, but boy, he is all over the Percocet. I would be concerned, okay? We actually, that's how we call somebody. And at first, it's easy to dismiss it. Oh, they're just helpful. They don't want their friends to, you know, be struggling, they're so busy. No, okay? Be cognizant, be aware. Don't witness for somebody because they're your friend and you don't think they look like they have a drug problem. We have called over 20 people in the last 15 months, three of which were injecting fentanyl while they were at work, okay? So be aware of the fact that once it gets to that point, it's worse even than when they're just taking pills, right? Because you're at risk of things being tampered with. These are the lawsuits that you see across the country because people end up getting hep C, all right? They're not careful anymore. They don't care. They just need what they need. And part of the issue is, the reason you don't think they look high, you've never seen them sober. <laughs> right? It's their normal. It's how you met them. They're just ditzy. They're always that high stuff. Okay? So please know that this happens. I'm not saying that you need to think all your coworkers are drug addicts. I'm just saying, <laughs> be aware. I'm starting to think that everybody is, but be aware that it happens. Discrepancies have to be resolved immediately okay if you create a discrepancy get it resolved do not pull out 22 percocets at the beginning of your shift just in case a patient might need one throughout the day okay don't take them home don't take seven hours to waste the lauded just the lot every time because guess what i don't think you're wasting it into a proper receptacle okay does anybody have any questions about this and again if you suspect it don't think about it as tattling. My six-year-old's very focused on, well, they did such and such, and we had to explain there's an appropriate time to report things and a time to mind your own business, right? This would be an appropriate time to report things. Two reasons why. If they're your friend, you don't want them to leave an overdose. It's happened, okay? If they're not your friend, they're taking care of somebody's family member. You don't get to come to work drunk. You shouldn't come to work hot because you could hurt somebody, right? 
Plus, if you're taking somebody's pain meds and then they're not getting them, you see what I'm saying? Does anybody in here have an experience with this? You would be shocked at people that have unfortunately encountered it on multiple occasions where it was somebody they knew and they found out on the back side. Does anybody have anything to share? Um, it's sad that, I mean, it's okay, it's on the news actually. He worked at Memorial in the ER. And so they were at home. I don't know what they were doing with it, but they both OD'd and he died. And I would have never suspected that. Like he was my good friend. I told him everything. And on that note, real quick before, is that um, every person we've called when the nurse director was confronted, no way. They're my best nurse. They're always working out. All the things that you would say that you would think would make them sound better are actually huge red flags. Of course they want to work all the time. Right? I mean, why wouldn't they? Of course they're in a good mood. So, all, of course, everybody likes them. So, those are the, and just because you want to work over, again, doesn't mean you're diverting drugs. But the point is, is it is a common thread. Yes, ma'am, and then I'll get to it. Oh, I actually worked in another hospital before here, and we have had travel nurses that were coming yep. in who were really short staff. And there was one, this was just a couple months ago, and she actually worked, was ordering pain medicine on patients from another nurse's computer. And she was going in and getting the medicine and charting it like she gave to the patient yep. and then going in and canceling the order and taking it for herself. So you just have to be careful about leaving it up and all that kind of stuff. Very good point. Okay. But, and that's part of the issue. Lots of manipulation, lots of workarounds. The longer the person's been doing it, the more ways they figure out to get away with it. Yes, sir. So you mentioned uh, uh, patients getting hep C earlier. So I worked at the, the hospital in Denver yeah. where the scrub tech had uh, diverted all the meds off of the anesthesiologist's workstation, injected herself, and then put the med put the syringes back, and then the patients got uh, hep C. And then in the second operating room I worked at, I guess an anesthesiologist got caught while I was behind, on the other side of the drape from him. Charge nurse was looking in, watched watched them inject themselves. Yeah. While I was in the OR, never saw it. And that's one other thing to keep in mind. Typically, these individuals, at the point that they're noticeable, it's either because they're in withdrawal or because they're so severely addicted that they're, you know, beginning to show. And so that's the problem. And ideally, in my opinion, I would like to catch it before it escalates to that point, right? Before somebody's life is at risk. So just, again, just everybody needs to be aware of it. It's all of our responsibility to try to keep us accountable and to know it's a risk. Any questions? And I like to thank y'all for sharing because I do sometimes think that when y'all share with each other and give stories, it helps more so than a pharmacist saying, well, you know, I mean, pharmacists can divert too. We have to look in our own. The funny thing is, is a lot of people think that pharmacists have a lot of access. I don't know my passcode to get into the Omnicap. So I don't ever have any reason to, right? So really and truly, nurses and a select few members of the pharmacy department touch meds, specifically anesthesia, um, more than anybody else, right? And so that's the reason the risk is so high. Okay, well, I appreciate your time. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Welcome to Erlinger. You all have a great day. Does anybody want to do a song and dance number for the video? Okay.